Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to another video here on the channel. My name is Julius Chagas, and if you haven't yet, subscribe to the channel and turn on the bell to receive notification of all of our new videos. In today's video, I'm going to talk about Philadelphia's Poison Ring, a criminal organization responsible for the death of 140 people in the 30s. But first, before we start, how about giving this video a like to help us out, alright? So, let's go to the video. The Philadelphia Poison Ring was a criminal organization that operated from 1931 to 1938. They were responsible for the death of more than 140 people, mostly by poisoning. Its main members and heads of the scheme were cousins Herman and Paul Petrillo, both Italian immigrants who came to the United States at the time of World War I. Herman was a seller of Italian pasta, like spaghetti and pasta in general. Paul, on the other hand, was a tailor and had his own store in the city of Philadelphia. The city of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, had a large community of Italians. In 1910, this number was more than 75,000. In 1930, this number more than doubled to 155,000. This was one of the reasons why the Petrillo's cousins chose the city, which even in the neighborhood where they lived was more spoken Italian than English. Philadelphia was also one of the most violent cities in the United States. It was a great stronghold of criminals of all types and of various ethnicities. Although the name Philadelphia means city of brotherly love in Greek, there was no much love and brotherhood there. The city even got to earn several nicknames that mention its bad reputation. One of them was Kilosophia, which was due to the hybrid of crimes involving homicides that occurred there. With the Great Depression of 1929, that drove millions of people into unemployment and destitution, Herman and Paul had to look for other sources of income, as their jobs were no longer giving them what they needed to survive. Then in 1930, they started their first criminal activities. Herman Petrillo becomes a money counterfeiter and an arsonist. Arsonists were people hired by the Mafia or even by people to set fire to buildings that had insurance. So people who owned these buildings were insured through this arson. Paul Petrillo, on the other hand, ran an insurance fraud scheme behind his dealer shop that acted as a front. He also sold potions that many believed to be magic and turned to when they wanted something, a kind of witchcraft. People at the time, especially women, were very superstitious. They would believe in magic, magic potions, witchcraft, so Paul even made a good money with it. Paul even sold a dose of his potion for $300, which if converted to the present day, would be about $4,500. He had a good client list. Most of them were women who were unhappy with their marriage, to the point of taking all the savings they had to buy a potion. Some of these women were interested in the love potion that promised to make their husbands love them again. Others wanted the potion known as Dispatch, which was intended to make their husbands leave. Both potions to work had to be taken only by their husbands, so the women put the potion in their drink without them knowing anything about it. Herman and Paul made a good profit from sales of their potions, however, they were very greedy men and wanted more money. With that, they came up with the idea of forming a macabre scheme that became known as Philadelphia's Poison Ring. And then, the following year, in 1931, they started the criminal activities of that organization. The organization's financial arm was a scheme that worked as follows. Women unhappy in their marriages who came to them because of the love potion or the dispatch were enticed into the scheme. There were two types of approaches to engage in these women. Those interested in the love potion were told that the potion had two effects. Either the husband would love them again or he would die, making it clear that if the husband died, they would be at fault and could be criminally liable for it. With the possibility of the husband dying, Herman and Paul offered an insurance policy for the wives, which in case of death, they would receive a good amount. However, there were two conditions. One was that the policy should benefit one of them as well, which in case 
they would keep 50% or more of the insurance amount. And the other condition was that their husbands could not know about this insurance policy, so they asked their wives to take their husbands' documents without them knowing, and then they forged a signature by entering into an insurance policy whose insured didn't even know about it. Because the economic situation in the country was collapsing due to the Great Depression, and the majority of the population was almost destitute, most women accepted these terms. In this way, Herman and Paul had these women under control and knew that they wouldn't go to the police because if they did, they would also be arrested. With these women recruited and the insurance policies in place, it was time to move on to the next phase of the scheme. Herman and Paul put considerable amount of arsenic in the potions, a methylite element that if used as a poison can cause numerous reactions in the body, from severe headaches to heart attacks. In addition to having no taste or smell, arsenic acts quickly in the body, being absorbed into the blood within 30 minutes or at most an hour. Afterwards, it spreads throughout the body, affecting all organs until a general poisoning of all cells occurs, thus causing death. When her husband died, a member of the organization and the wife received insurance, even though she suspected that she was used to poison her own husband, she did not report the organization to the police for fear of arrest or even death. Now, the approach for women who were already interested in getting rid of their husbands was more direct, as their intention was already to get rid of their husbands. Herman and Paul made a proposal to them. They offered to put an end to them and they would still get good money for it. But in exchange, they would have to make the insurance policies benefiting one of the members, who would keep more than 50% of the value. And of course, none of the husbands were aware of these policies. There was also a difference in the insurance policies for women who wanted to get rid of their husbands. It was a clause that said that violent death would pay a higher amount. Being like that, Herman and Paul had the husbands of these women killed and all of their full knowledge and approval. These policies at the time came to pay up to $10,000, which converted to the present day would be more than $150,000. Herman and Paul took the lion's share, about 60 to 70% of that amount, the rest staying with the wife. This scheme was making a lot of money for the Petrillo's cousins, so they decided it is time to expand their business. In 1932, Herman and Paul recruit Morris Bulber, a Russian Jew known as the Rabbi, who claimed to be a master of the black arts and play a key role organizing the traps surrounding mysticism. In the same year, they also recruited Karina Favato, who was known as the Philadelphia's witch. She was responsible for administering potions and enticing more women into the scheme. In the following year, in 1933, Herman and Paul already commanded a vast network of criminals spread across three neighboring states, including New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. As the crisis in the country grew due to the Depression, more people joined the Petrillo's organization. Only high-ranking members knew how the scheme worked, thus avoiding competitors and even police investigations if any member was arrested. Within the organization, there was a group responsible only for collecting information about the victims. They followed these people and made a detailed report of their routine. This report was then passed on the chiefs, who with the information gave the order for another group to commit the murder. Herman and Paul used codes to give orders to the henchmen. When they wanted someone killed, they told them to send that person to California. According to the police, this is how they ordered the deaths of two men, Ralph Caruso and Joseph Farina, both beaten and later drowned when they went fishing, and the same with another man named John Wallachin, who was brutally beaten and run over several times with a car. The FBI was already eyeing the Petrillos, specifically Herman, who was being investigated for counterfeiting and contraband. They had no idea the Petrillos were behind something much bigger. In June 1938, a man named George Meyer had just been released from prison. He wanted to start his life over and needed money to do it. He went to Herman Petrillo and borrowed $25 so he could start his own business. 
Herman then made a proposal to George, saying he would give him 600 if he killed a man named Ferdinand Alfonsi, and it had to be hitting him over the head with an iron bar and then throwing him down the stairs of a building. As you can see, Ferdinand had one of those policies that paid more for a violent death. And of course, he didn't know that, but his wife did. George refuses Herman's proposal. He makes the excuse that he just got out of prison and the cops were keeping an eye on him. After that, he went to Philadelphia's police, where they turned a blind eye and didn't want to believe him. They certainly received money from the organization, since police corruption at the time and in that city was very high. He then decided to go to the FBI, as the feds were already investigating Herman. They believed in George and put together a plan to get the Petrillos arrested. The plan was for George to go back to Herman along with undercover agent Stanley Phillips. They would say they were interested in the work to assassinate Ferdinand, so they would have enough time to gather evidence and then arrest them. On August 1, 1938, George met Herman at a restaurant. He took the undercover agent who introduced himself as Johnny, saying he had just come out of prison where he had served time for murder. Herman was a little uncomfortable talking in public. They then decided to leave the restaurant and go to the car. There, they talked about the plan to kill Ferdinand. The undercover agent needed more evidence that could lead the patrols to jail. He then suggests that Herman give them money so they can buy a car and with that car they would take Ferdinand far away in a remote location and run him over, leaving his body on the road. His intention was to make Herman give him fake money so he would have more evidence in his hands to get him arrested. Herman liked the plan, however, he suggested that he steal a car instead of buying one, which ended up delaying the plans a bit. George, Stanley and Herman were communicating for two weeks, until on August 22, 1938, they were reunited. Herman still didn't want to give them the money to buy a car, so Stanley took another approach. He asked him if he knew anyone who sold counterfeit bills, as he was interested in buying some. Herman doesn't suspect and then says he has a few. He takes a fake $5 bill out of his wallet and shows it to Stanley. Stanley is impressed with the quality of the bill. Then he says he's interested in buying $200 worth in counterfeit bills. Herman is a little reluctant, but then he says he can do it. However, it would take him two weeks before he could do it and deliver them. Two weeks go by and Herman shows no sign of life. Stanley is worried that probably Herman has discovered their plan to arrest him. So he contacts George and asks him to go after Herman. George then goes to all the places Herman used to go. But nobody knew about him and they said that they hadn't seen him in days. George was very worried. So he goes to the house of Ferdinand, the man that Herman wanted dead, to see if he could find out anything. Once there, he knocked on the door and was attended by Stella Afonsi, Ferdinand's wife. He identifies himself as being from the construction industry and would like to speak with the man of the house. Stella immediately said that it would be not possible as her husband was very ill and could not even get out of the bed. George is even more worried. He tells the woman that it's okay and that he hopes her husband to get better. Then, he runs to Agent Stanley and tells him everything he knows. Stanley immediately assembles a small team with other agents. They go to Ferdinand's house and identify themselves as life insurance and ask to see the man. When entering the room, they were amazed. Ferdinand had a dilated pupil and could not move or speak. The agents then call the Philadelphia police, then take Ferdinand to the hospital. At the same time, Herman contacts George and said he has the notes they had ordered. They arranged to meet at the bus stop, where Herman hands George and Stanley an envelope containing 40 counterfeit $5 bills. Pretending he didn't know anything, Stanley tells Herman that he's still interested in the job to get rid of Ferdinand. Herman looks at him with a smile and says it won't be necessary anymore, that Ferdinand went to the hospital and would only leave there for his funeral. Several other agents were around watching them just waiting for Stanley's signal so they could arrest Herman. Stanley gives the signal and the agents intercept Herman. They arrest him along with Stanley and George so that disguise is maintained. At the police station, case prosecutor Vincent McDevitt 
was skeptical about Herman turning over the other members of the organization, since the FBI itself was on his tail for years and only managed to arrest him for counterfeiting money and were unaware of the other criminal activities in which Herman participated. Prosecutor McDavid filed a charge of counterfeiting money and obtained murder against Herman, who was uncooperative and ended up in custody. McDavid also asked the hospital to test Ferdinand, as he suspected he had been poisoned. On October 27, 1938, Ferdinand dies. Test results concluded that his body had large amounts of arsenic, which confirmed his suspicion that he was poisoned. Harmon then went on to face a new charge, this time for murder. Prosecutor McDavid takes Herman in for questioning, who decides to cooperate. Herman talks about the organization, how the organization and its scheme worked, and he gives the names of all the members, including the bosses and his cousin Paul. He also made a list of all the names of the victims, including their wives, who helped murder their husbands directly and indirectly. He also said that they created a kind of marriage agency, where they found new husbands for the widows, and then they repeated the process of taking out an insurance policy in their name without them knowing and killing them to keep the money. The agents were amazed by Herman's testimony. They had no idea he was a much bigger fish than they thought. With all this new information, the FBI put together a large team and went after every member of the organization in four states, including Pennsylvania, New York, New Jersey, and Delaware. In total, 16 people directly linked to the organization and dozens of widows who were on the list that Herman made were arrested. The FBI also ordered more than 70 bodies to be exhumed so that the tests could be carried out that could prove death by poisoning, what was later proved. In the course of the investigations, it was discovered that the organization made more than 100,000 in the scheme alone, excluding the other criminal activities they carried out. This number, converted to current values, corresponds to more than $1,500,000. On March 21, 1939, all members of the organization are tried and found guilty. Widows were also tried. Those who did not intend to kill their husbands were liable for the crime in freedom, while those who intend to kill were sentenced to 14 years. The four heads of the organization had different convictions. Herman and Paul Petrillo were sentenced to the death penalty. Maurice Bolber and Karina Favado were given life in prison for reaching a deal with the prosecution, thereby getting rid of the death penalty. The other members of the organization, namely Cesare Valenti, Dora Sherman, Gaetano Cicinocci, Grace Giovanetti, and Samuel Sortino, were sentenced to 25 years in prison. Another seven members, of which I didn't find photos or names, and had the same 25-year sentence. On March 31, 1941, Paul Petrilli was executed in the electric chair, and on October 20 of the same year, Herman Petrillo had the same faith. The Philadelphia Poison Ring operated for seven years, carrying out the most diverse types of criminal activities and being responsible for the death of more than 140 people. Well, guys, so that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching me this far. I'll stay right here. Best wishes. Comment if you like. I'll see you next time.